I guess you take. <laughs> hey everybody, I guess I should take the lens cap off, right? Um, that's that's the photographer's problem. So uh, welcome everyone, and um, I'm Paul DeBurgis, and it's great to be here again with you tonight. We're going to talk about camera basics, part one. Um, I got a lot of feedback from earlier sessions, and we started with night photography. We transitioned then into moon photography, and, and those are really um, at least intermediate, if not advanced, topics to start off with. So I wanted to drop back and really focus on the uh, most basic of topics to kind of get everybody caught up with, um, with some stuff. Okay, I see my sound may not be the greatest. Let me make an adjustment here. that'll help a little bit and I'll re uh, reposition the microphone okay let's try that so before we get started um, just a couple of things I, I, I want to get right to the topic so I'm gonna kind of spare you the introduction if you're on my web page on colorbandit.com you can see a bio and you can download a PDF of a, of a short bio about me it's right up here, it says Paul's bio. Um, if you haven't already downloaded the notes, um, still echoing, okay. We'll try this. Um, according to my mixer, it looks like things should be okay. So um, take a look at the bio and also um, down below, thank you. Um, there's uh, the, the notes download for tonight's session. Um, so you can get that. Um, good, it looks, like, it looks like most people can hear well, so I'm glad to hear that. Um, so again, my bio is up above. The notes for the session are just below basics1.pdf, so you can download those. Um, for the chat tonight, last time it was really helpful for me to, uh, for when you put your questions on if you used bold font. And the control for bold font is down in the, in the for, on my screen anyway, it's right down below where I would type. You have bold, italics, and underline, and you can actually change colors of your, your message. So if you would put your questions in bold, that will help them show up um, f in, in, apart from all of the other chats and things that are going on while we're going through this. Also, as we kick off, if you would, um, chat me what city, state, or country you're watching from, so I know what the reach is for this. Also, um, if this is how many times that you've participated. Um, also, your camera type from this from the standpoint of uh, a cell phone camera, a point and shoot, or a DSLR or some kind of SLR high end camera. And then the other thing that I'm really curious about is. I'm looking to bring this to mobile devices as well. So if you have an iPod or an iPad or a smartphone and you wanna watch these videos live um, on your mobile device, let me know mobile yes or no, okay? If that would be an interesting option for you. So with that, we're gonna dive in. Um, if, if you have the handout, um, you'll see that we're gonna talk about three basic elements of the camera for tonight. Um, the, first, the first thing, it all has to do with how the camera works and and in the old days when we were shooting with film the camera itself had one basic job and that was to collect and focus light onto a flat plane which was the surface of the film and that was the only purpose for the camera now you could get electronic metering and you could get flash and you could get all these other these other things that help the uh, photographic experience. But the basic job of the camera was to collect and focus light. And that's what we're gonna talk about today is how digital cameras do that. Um, in the next workshop, in part two, that'll be next week, we'll talk about the different scene modes that you have in your point and shoot cameras and how those all work and, and how those go to create um, a picture. So to kick off tonight, the first camera setting, the first camera parameter that I'm going to talk about is the ISO. Now, depending on the kind of camera that you have, you may or may not even have a setting 
for an ISO at all. Um, the simpler cameras do all the, make all these decisions for you in advance, um, so you may not find that particular setting. But I want to talk through what that means because one way or another, um, your camera is selecting this setting for you, even if it's automatically, and um, it's it's in there. So, if if you shot in the old days with film, one of the things that you did when you bought your film was you selected a film speed, and back then it was an ASA rating. So you might buy an ASA 100 film or a 64 or a 200 or a 400. And the numbers from ASA film speed kind of translate forward almost the same way in digital. So today your digital cameras have an ASA, can be set to an ASA rating. And what that means is the image sensor itself in your camera um, has a certain sensitivity to the light that's falling on it. And you, you can think of ISO as a light amplifier. So if you have a lot of light, if you're outside and it's daytime, you don't need to amplify light very much because you have plenty of it. So you can use a, an ISO setting that is relatively low. Like the, on a digital camera, I think the lowest I've seen is around a 50 or a 64 or an 80 or a 100. Uh, maybe even 200 might be the lowest ISO, depending on your camera. The advantage to using low ISO whenever you're able to is you get the best quality pictures. Just like back in the film days, um, as you increased the ASA rating, as you increased the speed of the film, the sensitivity of the film to light, it, you had, there's a trade-off there, so you got graininess in the film. And to a great extent, that still happens today in digital. Um, so if you have the ability to set your ISO, the reason that I'm talking about that first is because ISO is the thing that I set first and try to leave alone regardless of whatever else I might change. Um, so if I'm shooting in bright light, daylight, um, or, or bright indoors, I'll set the ISO setting on my camera as low as possible. Now, think of the ISO setting kind of like um, a, uh, the volume knob on your car radio. And, and think of it as if you're listening to an AM station. If you're in town and in, in the city and you have lots of strong AM stations, you don't need to turn the volume up very loud to get a very clear signal. And, and everything's fine. As you go out into the country and you get really far away from any strong signal source, you may have to turn the volume up a little. And as you do, you probably hear some additional static in the background. Well, it's the same kind of thing as you um, using your camera in lower and lower light, the, the light that is there has to be amplified, and that's what the ISO setting does. So your camera, you may set this on purpose, or your camera may be doing this for you without your knowledge, but it's increasing the image sensor's sensitivity to light, and as it does so, as you get darker and darker, and you have to turn the volume up, if you will, on the light, you add in some static, you add in some noise, you add in some grain. And um, depending on how high you turn the ISO, you may just get a little bit and it's not real noticeable, or you may get a lot and it becomes very noticeable. Now, if you're only printing pictures that are say four by six, or if you're looking at them um, in, a, in a relatively small window on your screen on a computer, you can turn the ISO up pretty high and you won't really notice any problems or, or any of the grain or anything like that. A lot of the prints that I make are poster size, 36 by 24. Heck, I even, I even have a, had a billboard in Denver last summer with some balloon pictures from the Snowmass balloon event. And, and so, I mean, some of my pictures get blown up, blown up really large. And any of that grain matters to me because the bigger the picture gets, and especially the closer you get to looking at it, the, uh, that, that graininess begins to show. So, um, again, if you're printing small, if you're printing like up to 8x10, generally that, that graininess won't show. And it's more important to be able to get a picture that is clear and well-focused um, than it is to worry about that grain. So ISO is the first um, base setting that you might want to worry about if you can. But even if you can't worry about it, even if it's not something that's, that's in your camera, just understand that as 
you shoot in darker and darker environments, like some of these nighttime shots, the moon shots we've been doing, your camera is going to automatically increase that setting. And what's going to come with that is going to be a little bit of graininess and, and a little bit of noise in the picture. And I remember someone posted on my Facebook page, one of the moon pictures they took, um, one of the questions came was, um, why does it look kind of grainy? And that was the first thought that occurred to me was perhaps they either set their ISO really high or um, the camera did that as part of one of the scene modes or one of the automatic settings. So I'm looking at the, the text screen right now in front of me and um, I don't see any questions at this point about ISO. So um, if you look in the handout on the second page, you can see a couple of pictures that uh, one is a, a, a photo of some flowers in the foreground and the sun is in the background. And, and in a setting like that, where it's so bright that you even have the sun in the picture, obviously I can shoot at very low ISO. Uh, I, and and on, on my cameras, it's either 100 or 200, depending on which camera I use. Um, the other picture that you see, the one of the balloons at night, that's Dawn Patrol in Albuquerque. Um, Dawn Patrol is when the balloons actually take off about, I don't know, 45 minutes or 30 minutes before sunrise. It's still dark. It's absolutely dark. And they take off. And so I need to increase my ISO because I'm shooting um, handheld. I'm not using a tripod. I didn't use a tripod with that picture. And so I needed to get my shutter speed high enough that my natural body shaking wouldn't um, come through in the picture. So I had to crank my ISO up. And when I shoot the, uh, those Dawn Patrol pictures, I'm generally at an ISO maybe 800 or 1600, sometimes as high as 3200. If I have to go to 6400, um, I may go that high. But again, when I get up to 32 or 6400, I start to see some of the graininess. And, and Vita Loca, I see your, your, your comment there that you can see some graininess in that picture. I'm not surprised because again, I had to boost the ISO. So that's, that's what happens as the, uh, the ISO goes up and, and you kind of turn up that volume knob on your image sensor. Okay, again, I'm not really seeing any questions about ISO, so I'm gonna move into the, the next topic. Now, uh, I actually, before I do that, if you look at the top of that page where you see the little bar graph, the little, the little line of ISO, and it goes from 50 to 100 to 200, let me introduce some vocabulary to you uh, because it's, it's something that you may hear other photographers say or if you're reading online, and that, that vocabulary word is the word stop. You've probably heard about f-stops or you've heard about stops in photography. And so think of that as a unit of measurement. Don't try to assign anything to it right now. You know, if you're measuring something with a ruler, the, the unit of measurement is an inch. If you're measuring a plot of land, the unit of measurement might be an acre. When we talk about exposure in photography, the unit of measurement is a stop. And if you look at that bar graph at the top of the page where it goes from 50 to 100 to 200 to 400, notice each increment doubles. So 100 to 200 is doubling, 200 to 400 is doubling, 400 to 800 and so on is all doubling. Every time you double the ISO, you increase by one stop, okay? You'll find that Throughout photography, when you, when you double a setting, you increase by one stop. And the same thing when you go the other direction, if you cut it in half. So if we were reducing our ISO, let's say from 1600 to 800, cut it in half. 800 down to 400, cut it in half again. That's reducing by one stop. So again, I just want to uh, point out that vocabulary word, stop, generally means going up in a, by a factor of two doubling or going down by a factor of two halving, cutting something in half, cutting that value in half. And when we talk about exposure overall, you're going to see how the different exposure variables, ISO, aperture, and shutter speed, all work together so that you can get the same exposure and adjust all these different variables. Now, I'm trying to keep this as basic as possible. So if, if that doesn't make sense just yet, then, then sit on it for a minute as we, we talk about these other topics. Okay, so I still don't see any questions in the chat about ISO. 
So let's go on to the next exposure variable that we can talk about, and that is lens aperture. Okay. Now, if you look in the picture at, at the handout and the picture on the top of page three, you'll see what I'm talking about. And I actually have a sample lens here that I'm going to show you. So here's a, an old lens that I took off a film camera from the old days. And the reason that I use this one is because it's going to be really easy to um, demonstrate the, the effect of the aperture. So inside this lens, and I'm going to get really close to the camera, inside this lens you can kind of see a hole behind the, um, you can see a small hole in there. There's actually a diaphragm in the lens that you can adjust and you can make the lens opening larger or smaller. And this is the aperture of the lens. And so when we talk about lens f-stops, what we're talking about is the size of the hole in the lens formed by this diaphragm, okay? So this particular lens is an f2. Um, and, and so that's as wide as it will go. And so that, that large hole would be the f2 setting for this lens. And the minimum um, f setting for this lens is, uh, looking here, it's a 16. So for this lens, that hole would be an f16 setting. And I, I, I realize the uh, camera's trying to get focus on it there, so it may not be in, in crisp focus on the, the video. Um, but this is what we're talking about when we're talking about aperture. And every camera, regardless of whether you have a really expensive lens and, and DSLR setup or a point and shoot, has an adjustable aperture. Most cell phone cameras do not. That aperture is fixed. And in the old days, if you had one of those disposable film cameras or one-time use film cameras, most of the time those apertures were fixed as well. So the really inexpensive kinds of point and shoot cameras in the film days were fixed apertures. But today, if you have a point and shoot or, or higher, you generally have a variable aperture. Now the question is, how do I set that? And again, you may not be able to. This may be something that's pre-programmed in the different scene modes. But let me talk about that for just a second. If you look in the handout, you'll see two pictures that illustrate um, why aperture matters for you. Because I think the logical question is, if I, if I want to get as much light into the camera as possible, why wouldn't I use the big opening all the time? Why wouldn't I just use that? That's my default setting. Well, you could. And when I do my overnight shots, when I'm exposing for many minutes or, or maybe an hour, sometimes I use that setting to get as much light in there as possible. But the thing to understand about aperture is this, and it's called depth of field. And those two pictures on, in the handout on page three illustrate what I mean by depth of field. If you look in the top picture, I think automatically your eye goes to those two people and you look at the expression and you look at their hand gestures and you see all that. And the, then the other thing you notice is that the background is out of focus. That's what we mean when we talk about shallow depth of field. It's a very artistic effect and, it's, and it can be created with as simple as opening up the aperture as large as it will go and then focusing on that, in this case, the, the people, the element in the foreground, and, and very quickly, everything behind it falls out of focus. Um, you find this many times in portraits where you want to focus on the person's face and you don't really want the background to distract anything. So a lot of portrait photography is done with a very large um, aperture setting. And, and in the handout, um, I say that the large apertures are anywhere from the F1.2 to F4 range. Now, again, if you have a point and shoot, um, how do you know what aperture you're at? Well, let me show you this lens again. And every lens I've ever seen or every point and shoot camera, most of them that I've seen, will tell you what the available apertures are. And I hope the webcam can focus on here. Um, if you look at the writing that's on the front of the lens, one of the things, let me, let me turn it up right, one of the things that you can see is where it says 45 millimeters and then 
1 colon 2. That 1 colon 2 is telling me that this is an f2 lens, okay? Now, I'll show you a camera. Here's my Canon point and shoot. And on the front, right down here on the bottom, let's give the webcam a chance to focus, it shows that this lens is an f2.8 to 4.5. So it says it pretty clearly there. And I, again, I'm not sure the webcam, there we go, it's focused now. So you might be able to see. So if you look at your point and shoot and you see this setting, or you see those numbers, that's telling you what your lens possibilities are. Now, can you actually manually set these? Depends on your camera, okay? And again, that's why we're gonna talk about scene modes next week, because the scene modes are, are where the lens aperture comes in and is set automatically, even if you can't set them on purpose. So I don't have a timeline, or I don't have a, a, a bar at the top, uh, you know, like I did with ISO, showing you the different settings and the different stops. Um, so maybe you could, if you're taking notes, if you're writing things down, um, here are the aperture stops, one stop at a time. So if you start at, say, 1.4, which is a very large opening, and it goes to f2, f2.8, f4, f5.6, f8, uh, f11, f16, f22. Those are all one-stop increments in aperture settings. So if you were to um, go from, say, f2, to f2.8, that would be closing the lens aperture down by one stop. And if you went from f2.8 to f4, that would be closing it down another stop. So that means less light is coming in. If that were a problem, you might adjust one of the other settings, either ISO or shutter speed, by one stop or two stops to offset the fact that you had to close that lens aperture down so that you would have the same exposure. Now you're asking me again, why should I close that lens aperture down? I want it big, I, I wanna let a lot of light in. If you look at that second picture, um, chances are I took that picture, I don't remember right off the bat, that was one that I took at Albuquerque uh, Balloon Fiesta just last October, but um, Generally, I shoot at f8 when I'm doing kind of general purpose ballooning uh, photography. And take a look at that picture. Notice at the bottom of the picture, you can see that balloon fabric, that colored fabric. You can see in pretty good detail all the wrinkles and all the folds, um, the texture of that balloon fabric. And then if you look off into the distance to the farthest balloon that you can see, it's in sharp focus. And if you look in the clouds, it's in sharp focus. So when you're doing landscape photography or any kind of photography where you want everything to be in, in sharp focus from front to back, that's why you would stop down the aperture in your lens and allow yourself to have a much greater uh, depth of field. But as you close that opening down, you shut off light coming into the camera. And so you have to compensate some, somehow through either shutter speed or ISO so that you have your either your image sensor is more sensitive to the little bit of light that's there or your shutter stays open long enough to compensate for the smaller hole okay again all these settings work together and and that's why the concept of stops is important because if you give away some stops of aperture you have to take them back in the form of either shutter speed or iso to get the same exposure Okay, so the, uh, I, I see a couple of questions. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at this. Steve asks, when you leave a DSLR on auto, does it automatically give you a larger depth of field? Um, is, is it random on what the camera is calculating for the best picture? Um, depends on what you mean by auto, because there's auto from the standpoint of scene modes, and, there, and, and auto might be the PA... SM part of the setting, or if that's Nikon, if you're shooting Canon, it would be P, A, V, T, V, and M. So if it's, if it's the P, 
then um, it may not select the ISO for you automatically. If you're in an auto scene mode, then it probably is. Also, generally in a DSLR, you're going to have um, a setting in the menu that is auto ISO. So you can, you can let the camera pick the ISO if you want, no matter what you're in, even, even in a, a, a semi-automatic mode. So the, to answer your question, does it automatically give you um, uh, on auto, does it automatically give you a larger depth of field? Um, it, de it depends on what mode you're in. And, and so if we're talking about aperture, it, it might, it may change the aperture on you without your knowledge. So it, that's one of the reasons with a DSLR that you might want to take control of some of these settings because maybe you want a very shallow depth of field or maybe you want a, maybe you want a very extreme uh, depth of field and you don't want the camera to open that aperture up. So um, it's not random. It's depending on the, the light that's coming in and the programming that the camera has been given either by you or by the engineers in Japan who made it. Um, but it's, it's calculating what it thinks it needs for the best picture based on the, the, um, the settings. And when we get into scene modes next week, we talk about portrait versus landscape scene modes, it should be obvious from this conversation already that for a landscape scene mode, the aperture is probably gonna close up to get a deeper depth of field, whereas for a portrait scene mode, it's probably gonna open up so that you get that shallow depth of field that you like to see in a portrait. Um, so is depth of field, Vita Loca says, is depth of field entirely dependent on aperture only? Yes, it is. And a, a more advanced um, answer to that question would also involve whether you're using a point and shoot camera or a uh, large sensor DSLR. That's a little bit beyond what we're talking about here. I'll address that at some point in the future. But yes, depth of field is dependent on the aperture of the lens. That's how you are able to select depth of field. Um, let's see, another question, is there a way to calculate the range of depth of field, what's in focus? Yes, there is. And again, that's a little bit beyond what we're talking about today, but if you want to look up hyperfocal distance, go on Google and search that term, hyperfocal, H-Y-P-E-R-F-O-C-A-L. Uh, there is, a, it's, it's all math, it's all physics, it's all optics, so you can predict, and in fact, in the old days, um, it's kind of hard to see on this particular lens, but in the old days, lenses had these depth of field scales on them. And you could actually preset the lens and you would get the depth of field that you wanted um, without having to even worry about, you know, the manual setting of the, the aperture. You could use that depth of field scale. Um, and, and this is one of the techniques that I use when I'm shooting in the darkest of night because it's the camera can't autofocus when there is nothing bright to lock onto. So I'll use my knowledge of hyperfocal distances to preset the camera focus and, and pretty well guarantee that I'm going to get the focus even though the camera can't autofocus and um, I don't really have a, a scale or anything that I can work with. So again, look for, look, do a Google search on hyperfocal and you'll find the answer to, um, to that. Okay, another question, how do you change the aperture on a Nikon? Um, I am a Nikon guy when it comes to DSLRs. If you're in the aperture priority mode, it's a simple changing, you just roll the, the thumb or the forefinger dials back and forth. The, again, this is another feature of the, or I don't think it's a feature, I actually think it's a little bit of a drawback. On these older lenses, I could change the aperture setting by just turning a, a setting on the lens. The newer lenses don't have that. The newer lenses are all controlled by the computer inside of the camera itself. So even with an expensive DSLR, you have to use the, the thumb wheel or the, the finger wheel to control aperture. Um, so uh, let's see, uh, William asks on page five, how was that photo taken? Th that was the, uh, um, picture of Garden of the Gods, black and white picture. Um, and that was one that I, I shot for absolute depth of field. So I was probably shooting that one at, at around F11, maybe F16. I generally don't shoot any higher than F16. And, and the reason for that is, again, beyond this. But 
um, F11 or F16. I was on a tripod. That was actually uh, before sunrise. The sun was not up yet. Um, the color version of that picture is on my Facebook page as my header picture. Um, I used my, uh, my software to convert that to black and white because I just thought it looked pretty cool in black and white too. So um, that was taken in color. You can see it on my Facebook page or you can take a look at it in that handout and see the black and white version. So, um, okay, cool, yeah, try it out, absolutely. I, I don't see any other questions related to Aperture. Um, so then I'm gonna move into the last of the three variables, and that's shutter speed. So again, you can look at um, page four in the handout, and you can see the little bar graph along the top, and at one end you have four with a double quotation mark. If you have the ability to manually change the shutter speed settings on your camera, the way that they show up in my handout is probably the way you're going to see them on the, uh, in the display or, or on your camera somewhere. So when you're shooting longer exposure shots, if it's like a couple of seconds, you're going to see those quotation marks indicating seconds. So on that graph, the longest shutter speed that I, that I um, documented was four seconds. Cut it in half, you have two seconds. Cut it in half again, you have one second. Cut it in half again, you go to half a second. Now, notice that when we change into the fractions of a second, you don't have one over two, like you don't have a one half symbol. It just says two. In your camera, when you're down to fractions of a second, it's only going to show the denominator of the fraction, okay? It's not going to show you the one over part. So as we move to the left on that handout, you get into 8 and 15 and 30 and 60. That's a fraction of a second. So it's one eighth of a second or one fifteenth of a second or one thirtieth of a second um, or one sixtieth of a second, okay? And again, notice that as you move in one direction, you're cutting the shutter speed in half. Now, the numbers get bigger as you move to the left, but that's because it's the denominator of a fraction. So half of 1 25th of a second is 1 250th. Half of 1 250th of a second is 1 500th. Half of 1 500th is 1 1000th. So those are one stop increments in speeding up the shutter speed. As you go to the left on that graph, you're getting a faster and faster shutter speed, okay? And yes, on your Nikon, William, the, the longest manual um, setting that they offer is 30 seconds. If you need to get a longer shutter speed than 30 seconds, you have to connect an external um, shutter trigger and use what's called the bulb mode. So if you go past 30 seconds, you probably see something that says bulb. What's a bulb? Well, in the old days, there was actually this air-operated um, thing that looked like it was at the end of a turkey baster, okay? It was a, a little uh, squeezy thing, and it was connected pneumatically to the shutter of the camera, and that's, as long as you kept that squeeze, that bulb squeeze, the shutter would stay open. And so that terminology has, um, has hung in there with us, and so the bulb mode on a camera means that you're manually opening and closing the shutter. And generally, that's used for the really long exposure. You can do a bulb exposure with two seconds. You just, you, you, it's usually a button now. So you click the button and then you let it up. Um, and the manual trigger that I have actually has a sliding switch. So I can push the button down and I can slide it locked so that the shutter stays open. And I can walk away from the camera while it's exposing for 10 minutes or an hour or whatever. I don't have to stand there and hold it. So typically, if you want to go faster than 30 seconds on most cameras, you have to have an external shutter trigger that, that plugs into the camera somewhere. So again, back to stops. Um, the, uh, the, as you move to the right, you're increasing the shutter speeds on that graph as you move to the right by one stop increments. So you're doubling the amount of shutter speed. So if you're at one one thousandth of a second and you double it, it, it increases or decreases to one five hundredth of a second and then you double it again, that's 1 250th of a second, you double it again, 1 1 25th. So again, it gives you the idea of one stop changes in your exposure. 
So if you have to stop your lens aperture down because you want depth of field, and, and let's say that you have to stop it down by two stops, in order to get the same exposure, you have to increase, lengthen your shutter speed by two stops, okay? So that's how stops work. And, and, and you can use ISO stops, and you can use uh, aperture stops, and you can use shutter speed stops, and have them all work together to give you the shutter speed that you want, or the depth of field that you want, or the lack of graininess that you want. These are all the controls so that as you become more creative and you become more um, knowledgeable about how the camera works, um, you can use those different settings to create the kind of picture that you want. And it's great. It is fun. Um, it's really fun to learn this stuff and, and to be able to use it. And, and again, for those of you with point and shoot cameras, these settings, if they exist at all, are probably buried in a menu somewhere. Or if you have a very simple camera, you may not have the ability to change these settings at all. So again, that's why in part two next week, we're gonna talk about the scene modes, and I'm gonna to explain to you what the engineers probably did when they set up a portrait or a night landscape or a landscape or a fireworks or a beach setting or any of those scene modes that you have in the camera. So you know which one to use, and if they don't offer you the scene that you want, which scene will give you just about what you're looking for. And that's really the most important part. And that's why I'm laying this foundation right now, because I want you to understand how those scene modes work. Okay, I see I got some questions rolling in. Um, on your Nikon, it shows the 1 4,000th of a second all the way down to 30 seconds. Yeah, and, and, and um, depending, on, again, on how you have your camera set, it may give you those, those steps in one stop increments or half stop increments or one third of a stop increments. So there's, there's a lot of flexibility into how you can program your camera to offer those selections to you. Um, right, it doesn't say, and it won't say stops, it's up to you to understand that that's how the increments go. Um, is there a starting point for stops for each setting? How do you know what shutter speed is two stops down from a particular f-stop? Well, it's all relative. So if I'm, let's say I'm at to an F2 right now, I know this, and I don't expect you to remember these things, but I'm just weird like this and numbers are easy for me. So if I'm at F2 right now, two stops smaller than F2 is F2.8 and F4. So I just know that, and I, and I know it, call me crazy, but I just use it so much that it's committed to memory, I've learned it. Um, so it's probably, probably not as important to maybe know exactly how many stops you're going. Because with a point and shoot, one of the things that's great about any digital camera is you can see the image on the screen. And most of the time, when you press the shutter button down just halfway, you don't take the picture, you just push the button down a little, the camera goes into whatever mode it's gonna be in, and what you see on the screen is the picture that you're gonna end up with when you just push your finger halfway down. So even if you don't know exactly what stop you're in, you can kind of preview the picture before you take it by pressing the shutter button partway down and then look at the LCD display on the back and that will give you what you should expect to see. So um, as far as a, a starting point again, um, if, if you have the ability to manually set these settings, one, there's a couple of things that you can do. Every digital camera records the settings that it used in, the, uh, in, in some invisible data that's recorded along with the image file. And that's called the EXIF data, E-X-I-F. And so, yeah, metadata is, a, is, is, is another term for it. So a lot of software that comes with your camera will uh, allow you to read that metadata or the EXIF data. And so you can tell what settings the camera actually used. Another thing that you can do is you can, if you have the, again, if you have the ability to set these settings manually, put your camera in full auto mode and then push the shutter button down halfway and look at the settings that the camera decided it wanted to use. So you can see what shutter speed for that amount of light and what aperture and what ISO settings. The camera will tell you that. 
And so you can say, OK, that's kind of what the camera is deciding I, I, I should have as a starting point. And then if you decide artistically you want more depth of field, then you know, OK, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close the aperture down a couple of stops. But I also have to lengthen my shutter speed by that number of stops to get the same setting as the camera wanted to give me in the first place. So um, that's, that's um, one way that you can do that. And, and if you don't have software with your camera, there is some freeware that I use. And it's, called, it's made by a company called Opanda, like a panda bear, but Opanda, O-P-A-N-D-A. That's the name of the publisher. And their, their software tool that reads the metadata, the EXIF data, is called iExif, and that's the letter I, E-X-I-F. So if you go on the internet and you search for Opanda iExif, you'll get it. It's a free download. And then all you have to do is, is use that program to access, the, um, to access any of the picture files, and it will come up with a table and give you all kinds of information. And, and so it's a really useful program. It'll tell you a lot more than what you ever wanted to know about that particular picture. It'll also tell you some cool things about your camera, too. So OK, um, Steve, Canon 30D. I always seem to have dust spots on my fo photo. My hurricane bulb doesn't ever seem to help. Couple of questions. Would air from a compressor be? T I wouldn't use, don't use a bicycle pump. Don't use an air compressor. I don't have one here down uh, in the studio with me, but there are bulbs that have plastic nozzles um, that are especially designed to, to clean your image sensor. Um, I use, I have a couple of different sizes, and I've had excellent luck cleaning any and all dust spots off of any of those, um, any of my image sensors with just those. Don't use a high pressure compressor like you would fill up a tire with. Um, use one that was made for your camera um, because you don't, you don't want to mess with that. And also, when you're cleaning your camera, now this, this is uh, not a replaceable lens, but when the, uh, whenever you have your lens off the camera, always have the camera body pointed down like this. And if you clean it, clean the, uh, the uh, sensor like this so that as particles are removed, they'll fall out, or chances are most of them will fall out. Um, and even when you're storing your camera, uh, I try never to store my cameras on their back so that the sensor would allow gravity to put dust on it. I would always store my cameras with the sensor down uh, like this. So I hope that helps. Um, th and, and you are going to get dust, dust spots. I see your second question there. Yeah, you're right. That's, that's excellent. Um, uh, Aaron, you will get oil from other kinds of compressors. And so, oh yeah, I do have one of these. And so here's my, um, my little uh, sensor cleaner. Um, and it works. Been using it for years. I've never had to go on with any of the liquid swabs or anything like that. Um, that little guy has always worked. So you're going to get those because life happens. And as you, you remove and replace your lenses, no matter how careful you are, dust is going to get in there. So unless you live and use your camera in a clean room, just get used to it. OK. So a um, couple of last points now on shutter speed. You can see in the pictures on page four, the top picture was taken with a very fast shutter speed and could freeze that waterfall in motion. And, and so that's one of the things that high shutter speeds can do for you. The flip side of that with a slow shutter speed, same kind of waterfall, not the exact same waterfall, but the same concept, with a, an exposure of, of maybe a quarter of a second or a half a second or one or two seconds, you can, um, you can, you can make the uh, effect of that really dreamy, silky looking water. Um, now that particular shot is one that you always want to do in shade. Uh, if the sun is out and shining on the water, it's really hard to get those slow shutter speeds for one. Also, I've had people in other sessions ask me about neutral density filters. This is a really good application for a neutral density filter um, because it will knock down the light to allow you to get the longer shutter speeds you need to, to have to get that water to look really silky and nice. So Steve, again, you're, uh, would I clean before every shot? Oh, no. Um, I generally clean before um, or, or like when I first get back from uh, an event. I shoot a lot of hot air balloon events where I'm outside changing lenses and stuff outside. So at the end of the day, when I'm finished with that event, I'll um, use my, my blower and I'll clean the sensor off, you know, like once a day. Um, if I'm shooting an indoor event 
like at, at, a, at a hotel or, or a convention center or something like that. Again, I may be changing lenses, but if I'm not outside in the blowing dust, I may not change or I may not clean the sensor until um, I actually see some dust spots. Also on my cameras, there is an, a setting in the menus for automatic dust cleaning. So the sensor itself in a lot of cameras has the ability to do some minor um, housekeeping on itself. And so that'll, that'll clean it up. Um, not every shot, but event, yeah. So um, typically that's, that's how I would clean my sensor. Cool, so um, we've kind of reached the end um, of, our, of our time period. And again, I just want to recap the concept of stops, either doubling or halving the setting. Um, and, and I see the question about future handouts. Would I put the settings? Um, you know, sometimes I, I don't remember those and uh, I have my master image files somewhere else besides the place that I have my, the smaller versions that I put on these handouts. So if I remember that, if I can, if I can find those exact settings, I will. Um, but again, I think the, the, really the important thing is that you go out and you practice and, and see what works for your camera because if your settings, like I have my DSLRs and I have some really fast lenses like f1.4. Well, if you, can't, if you can't get to that setting, you're gonna have to figure out what your camera can do. So happy to give you um, some, some tips on where to start. Um, question there about canned compressor air for computing key, key, computer keyboards. No, again, I'm back to this. Just use this guy, don't use any other kind of air. Now, on the outside of your camera, if you wanna get dust off, no problem. If you wanna get dust off the outside of your lens um, on the non-glass surfaces, no problem. But on any glass surface for the lens or inside your sensor, this is as powerful as I would recommend you go. There's way too much that could be damaged um, by a particle of sand or grit or, or something that got kicked up. Um, and, and so anyway, that would be my comment. Um, so cool, we're, we're again, we're, we're really out of time at this point. Um, and if you've got any other questions, now would be the time to put them up. Otherwise, I wanna thank everybody for joining. This is an incredible turnout. Um, and next week, either Wednesday or Thursday night, um, I, I'm gonna do part two of this. So if you have a preference for nights, I'd be happy for you to text it up here. Um, again, it'll be at seven o'clock. Um, and we'll talk about the scene modes that are pre-programmed into your point and shoot. And then we'll also talk about white balance because that's, that's one parameter that we didn't talk about tonight, but that's also a really important factor in any of the scene modes that um, are built into your cameras. So anyway, I wanna thank everybody for coming out. Again, it's a lot of fun. Um, uh, if, if you haven't already and you've got some moon pictures, don't forget to put your to upload your moon photo, your best moon shot to krdo.com. Matt Meister um, is, is still running that contest. So uh, I'm really anxious to see what the winning shot's gonna be for that. That's uh, a lot of people were involved. So cool, everybody enjoyed it. I'm gonna hang around on chat for a few minutes after we shut the video down. So again, if you've got uh, more questions, put them on there and thank you so much. And we'll see you next week for part two. Excellent. Bye-bye.